Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. All right, let's get started. Welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, Nico Perino. Before we get started today, uh, a couple of quick notes. The first of which is that FIRE president and CEO Greg Lukianoff and New York University professor Jonathan Haidt They have a new book coming out on September 4th, just a little over a month from now, and it's called The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Now, I've mentioned the book on this show before, and I think since then I've had the privilege of reading an early draft. I say I think since then because I don't remember if I had mentioned it previously after I had read a draft, but I have read the draft now. And I really think this book is going to push the conversation about free speech forward in some meaningful ways. I think it'll take it into some new uncharted territory, which doesn't happen all that often in the free speech context. A lot of the arguments that we're making about free speech on this podcast are arguments that have been made for over 100 years. But Greg and John and their new book really bring some psychology into the conversation in a way that no one has really done before. So I think it's going to break some new ground in that sense. And the book is available for pre-order now on Amazon. And you can also find it with most other online retailers, book retailers, that is. And those of us at Fire who've been working with Greg on the book, uh, both in the uh, research and in the publicity components of of putting it together, of putting it out, uh, we really hope it'll land on the bestsellers list right out of the gate. And if that's the case, then free speech arguments are going to become primetime arguments, um, primetime topics for debate, hopefully for weeks and months to come after the book's release. And pre-orders really do help put a book on that bestsellers list right out of the gate. And it's super important. And as an added bonus for our supporters of both this podcast and of fire, uh, a portion of the book's proceeds go to support fire. So if the, the ideas in the book aren't incentive enough and you're a supporter of fire, uh, rest assured that the book also supports fire. Anyway, uh, the main reason I wanted to record this introduction is because I wanted to let you all know a little bit a uh, backstory with my conversation with Jakob Mushangama, which I'm going to play for you here in a moment. Uh, Jakob is the executive director of Justitia, which is a think tank in Denmark, and he's a visiting fellow working on a new podcast called Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech. And it might not actually be appropriate to call it a new podcast because the podcast has been out since January, uh, but it's new in the sense that uh, it's happened. It started this year, uh, and it's newer than this podcast, which at this point is two and a half years old or going on two and a half years old, which is just really hard for me to believe. Um, But the conversation I recorded with Jakob actually occurred last month. Uh, And the podcast was supposed to run two weeks ago, but the Supreme Court and its new nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, kind of got in the way of that. The, The decisions coming down from the Supreme Court at the end of last month, the end of their term, and the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh after the announcement from Justice Anthony Kennedy that he was retiring just made it sort of impossible to ignore. So I I organized a crack squad of free speech First Amendment experts to record the podcast that came out two weeks ago about the court's decisions and, of course, the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, which pushed this conversation that you're hearing today with Yaka Mushigama back about two weeks. Uh, but here it is. And usually, again, I wouldn't even mention this, but for the fact that actually 75% of the conversation that Jakob and I have today is focused on an online debate Jakob was participating in for the Cato Institute's monthly debate series called Cato Unbound. And Jakob's debate about free speech and the international perspective occurred last month in June. So it was the June Cato Unbound series. I think there's probably a a new July one at this point. It's not a big deal, but I thought I would just give you all a heads up since when Jakob and I are speaking in this conversation, we're we're speaking as though the debate, the Cato Unbound debate is occurring right now rather than a month ago. 
And Jakob also makes a couple of references to episodes of his podcast that he was working on at the time, which have subsequently been released. But in any case, you can catch Jakob's June Cato Unbound online debate at cato-unbound.org. Again, cato-unbound.org. And of course, you can catch all of his podcast episodes at freespeechhistory.com. Now, with that out of the way, uh, let's get on with today's show. I am in my New York City apartment this morning, joined by Fire Visiting Fellow Jakob Mushengama. Jakob, thanks for uh, coming down to Midtown Manhattan today. Thanks for having me. It's how you like to be- how you like in New York so far? It's been brilliant. I am uh, borderline depressed about having to leave this great place. So you're from Copenhagen. I'm from Copenhagen. Yes, born and, and raised what, in Copenhagen. What brings you? What brings you here? So, um, well, your wonderful organization is is one important reason of it. So I'm a visiting fellow at, at FIRE, and also a visiting scholar at Columbia, where I uh, write and produce uh, my own podcast called Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech. Welcome to Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech by Jakob Mshengama. Yeah, so what's, what's that project? Yeah, so it's... Um, like yourself, uh, I'm, I, I'm obsessed about the issue of, of free speech. Uh, and so in the past two or three years, I've been more and more interested in the history of free speech because I think that uh, perspective is often uh, lacking from, from debates about uh, free speech. They tend to be sort of very focused on the specific controversy. Um, so I uh, wrote a, a, a book on the history of free speech in Denmark uh, and... Uh, and then I decided, you know, why not write a book about the history, the global history of free speech uh, as such? Uh, and um, along with, with FIRE, uh, uh, FIRE have been very supportive of, of, of that effort. And, and Columbia's Global Freedom of Expression Center w- were also willing to, to uh, give me a visiting scholarship. Well, it's a really cool project. So you started... Uh, with ancient Athens and explored the free speech that existed there. I think it was Isagoria and Parisia and, exactly. in the context of controversies in Athens. And you went to Rome and you've explored uh, medieval Europe, for example. You've explored the caliphates and you know sort of the, the free speech dynamics or lack thereof that might have existed in the Middle East, the free thinkers there. And now you are coming up on the Reformation, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. Our last episode was where we basically combined the uh, invention of the printing press with the Reformation because those two... Uh, meeting each other uh, sort of gave uh, rise to an explosive disruption, really, mm-hmm. of of, uh, of of Europe at at the time. Sort of parallels to social media today. In very some much, ways. very much so. Uh, we 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 tend to think that the internet is the greatest disruption in communication technology, and we've never experienced anything like it. I would argue that. The, the combination of the printing press and Martin Luther's uh, knack for communicating uh, was was a was a much larger disruption than the the one we are witnessing now. And you also do these expert opinions on your podcast, where yeah. so you have this narrative, yeah. this scripted narrative that you read out, uh, very engaging. I've learned a lot from it. Uh, but then you bring in experts in the field on any given subject, whether it's the caliphates or uh, medieval Europe or ancient Athens. You bring in scholars to kind of shed more light on the topics, exactly, and to nitpick what you've uh, what you've researched. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm a lawyer, um, uh, and and obviously not a historian. Even if if I was uh, a historian, there's no way you could be an expert on all the different themes and time periods uh, covered. So I think it's important, you know, I do my utmost to research uh, and, and spend a lot of time reading. I also have research assistants. So I, so I try to be really, and I also try, you know, to state it clearly when there's something, you know, where, you know, there are competing interpretations of what, what really uh, happened. Uh, um, but it's important also to bring in like experts to give their perspective and also so potentially set me straight when I've, uh, you know, gone astray. Yeah, it's a great podcast. You can learn more about it at freespeechhistory.com. And I'd urge all of you to subscribe and also review it on iTunes. I, I mention this in almost every podcast. Reviews really do help attract they new listeners sure to do. shows. 
I want to know why you are interested in free speech in particular. Now, I listen to this podcast called The Fifth Column. It's a sort of libertarian-leaning podcast with Camille Foster, um, Michael Moynihan, and uh, Matt Welch. And you were on that podcast recently talking about free speech issues. And I, I learned something about you that I didn't know before. I knew you had sort of been motivated to write about free speech issues after the cartoon crisis we had Fleming Rose on this podcast previously. But I also didn't know you sort of had family members who have dealt with censorship. Is that not the case? That That is true, yes. Uh, so my father uh, is from the Comoro Islands uh, in, in East Africa. He used to be in government, a politician, but he's now sort of more on grassroots NGO level. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a chronically politically unstable place, the Comoro Islands, with a very inefficient government. So he has been trying to organize general strikes. Uh, and uh, so what they've actually done a couple of times, the authorities, is to arrest him on hate speech charges, which I, th- I think is... is not funny would be the wrong word, but since I've 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 for a long time been arguing forcefully against hate speech laws in Europe, uh, it was interesting to me that a authoritarian state um, used hate speech laws <laughs> to to crack down on someone who is who is a democracy activist. So he's he's all he's organizing are general strikes or strikes in yeah, protest of yeah. the government. And Basically, the, the, the government not, you know, delivering basic uh, services and, and utilities, you know, power outages and not enough water, you know, roads that don't work, um, all these things that, that you and I take for granted uh, just, just don't work. And so, to you know, having a general strike is a way to put pressure on the government, you know, get, get, your, get your things in order. And obviously the government is not interested in that. And so that's a way to just to take, uh, to take someone out, you know, say, okay, we're going to arrest you for, put you, in, put you in prison for two or three days because then you're not able to organize uh, these, uh, these, these protests. And we do it on the basis of, of, of hate speech uh, laws. So he's been thrown in prison. So he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, uh, he and, and these are just like, typically it's two or three days perhaps. In his younger days when he was protesting French colonialism and, uh, and, 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 and the first dictator uh, there in the, in the, in the 70s, he, he spent longer periods in prison. But, but now it's more like typical like harassment for two or three days. Get to cool off and uh, make sure that you don't organize uh, protests. So does he still live there? Yeah, yeah, he lives there. Yeah, yeah. Were you born there? I wasn't born there. I've been there, um, but it, I haven't been there for twenty years. But I've been there a number of times. Was that was that the main spark for your interest in free speech, or was it really the the yeah? The I think Danish the, uh, I think I think I belong to a generation in Denmark where the cartoon uh, uh, the cartoon crisis really has been formative of my understanding of of, of free speech, along with with others, because. Up until then, you know, it was not really an issue that gave rise to much debate because Denmark was one of the countries in the world where free speech was best protected. And we had a tradition since the end of, uh, you know, after the Second World War of basically, I wouldn't say we had a First Amendment tradition, but, you know, we allowed communist parties that were clearly sympathetic to the Soviet Union to be represented in parliament uh, they could. They had a headquarter in Copenhagen with flags with hammer and sickle. You know, you had not very long time after Denmark was occupied by Nazi Germany. You had, you know, a Nazi party. It wasn't wasn't very big, but they you know they could hand out flyers in the street. So we had a very sort of liberal tradition where there were there was a sort of a political agreement that the best way to fight totalitarian ideas and movements was through open uh, debate and not hand them, you know, uh, martyr role and not try to, to repress them. Um, and uh, and then suddenly the cartoon crisis, you know, Julian's person, Fleming Rose, publishes these cartoons and, and, and then, you know, over a period of time, a huge crisis erupts. Yeah, so let's just reflect on what happened there. Yilin's Posten, which is sort of like the Wall Street Journal of Denmark. It's yeah. a very popular newspaper. Fleming Rose was the culture editor, I believe. And there was a situation, I believe somewhere in Africa, where a cartoonist refused to draw pictures of the Prophet Muhammad for a children's book. Uh, that was actually in Denmark. That was actually, there was a, there was a, there was, there was a, um, uh, sort of a left leftist cartoonist who who, uh, who who wanted to do a children's book and he couldn't about the uh, life of yeah, Muhammad yeah uh, and he and and he couldn't uh, get a cartoonist uh, to do that 
Um, and then, and there had been some other issues, sort of uh, both in Denmark and and in Europe, sort of questioning: Are there taboos? Is there a, a heckless veto, if you like, regarding issues uh, of Islam and especially the Prophet Muhammad? And so, Julian's Post and the Fleming Rose decided to to commission cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad from from Danish cartoonists, uh, and twelve responded, and and they were. They were published, I believe, on 30th September 2005. Um, and but the backlash w- didn't come until months later. No, it didn't come. Like it, it really uh, kicked off. I would say in the beginning of 2006, there was obviously some controversy. But you know, you had a number of Danish imams who went around in the Middle East, uh, trying to stir up Muslim majority uh, government uh, governments in Muslim majority countries to put pressure on Denmark, and they did. And then suddenly you had protests, you know, Danish embassy, in, I think, in, in Syria was 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 burned, uh, um, violent protests, uh, a lot of people died around the world. And funnily enough, uh, I think almost everyone who, who died in riots were, were in countries where free speech is not protected, where, whereas in, in countries where free speech is protected... Where normally that, that, people yeah. wouldn't be able to organize in the way that they organize exactly. and protest yeah. no, the I mean, cartoons. If you take Syria, it's, it's a good case. Uh, clearly there, the, um, the regime uh, saw it as a con- convenient way to sort of pander to Islamists who would otherwise be uh, opposed to them. Um, so, so, and then it just got out of, uh, out of hand and out of control. Um, so a lot of authoritarian regimes in the Middle East and North Africa s- saw, you know, rallying behind Islamists as a way to, to project themselves as the defenders of Islam, even though they may not themselves have been, you know, particularly uh, concerned, uh, about the cartoons and had a long record of, you know, putting Islamist preachers in, in, in torture ju- dungeons. Story, the outrage in the Muslim world over caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad. Any depictions of Muhammad are offensive to the faithful. But in many Western nations, freedom of expression is a sacred right as well, including the freedom to express offensive ideas. Keeping with this theme of free speech um, internationally, you're engaging in this debate for Cato in their Cato Unbound series every month, I think, they pick a topic and then they get some leading thinkers in the space to discuss that topic surrounding a lead essay. And yours this month was the lead essay and the topic is free speech in international perspective. Uh, other thinkers who are chiming in are Anthony Linker, he's a British scholar, uh, Jeremy Waldron, who many people who listen to this podcast might be familiar with him, his work surrounding hate speech. He had wrote a book called The Harm in Hate Speech, advocating for um, hate speech laws. Many people who are in the free speech community see it as the most nuanced, articulate advancement uh, of the argument in favor of hate speech. And then Jonathan Rauch, who our listeners will be well familiar with. So I, my idea for this podcast, if you're so uh, inclined, is to go through the essay systematically. Uh, so we can start with your essay, which is how censorship crosses borders, uh, and then look at some of the responses from Anthony Leaker and Jeremy Waldron, which were a bit critical. Uh, and then we'll close with Jonathan Rausch. And I want to get your responses to to all these essays. Now, we don't have Anthony Leaker here. He's in uh, the UK. We don't have Jeremy Waldron or Jonathan Rausch here. So I'm going to do my best to uh, represent these positions. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I will critique them at times as well uh, and join you in that. But... Your essay, How Censorship Crosses Borders, focuses on what you perceive to be a decline in respect for free speech and press freedoms internationally and the cross-fertilization of censorship that results from some of the laws or stigmas passed uh, that run contrary to free speech norms. In your essay, in Arguing for this decline in free speech, you cite that Freedom House has measured a decline in global protection of press freedom. Uh, The Economist 2017 Democracy Index was headlined Free Speech Under Attack, in which it concluded that less than half the population of the world now has access to free or even partially free media. And then you also cited a report from Reporters Without Borders that concluded it's in Europe, the region where press freedom is the safest, that the regional indicator has worsened most this year. That is the regional indicator for presumably press freedoms. And then you go on to cite some laws that are being passed 
in other countries. Russia's adoption of a social media legal code inspired by a German law requiring social media platforms to remove hate speech within 24 hours. In Germany, I think, if you don't remove the hate speech, you can get a 50 million euro fine. We talked a little bit about that with Nadine Strawson in a previous podcast. We look at you look at how many journalists were killed in recent years, uh, laws in France and Malaysia and Kenya. So, how did you first come to realize that free speech is in decline, or what made you first think that it was? Um, I think I think actually the cartoon uh, crisis made me realize that free speech was on shakier ground than I had thought because there you, you had, uh, at the time, it was sort of the center-left, progressive liberals who, to, who, who had been sort of the champions of defending free speech against Christianity and traditional values um, that suddenly said, well, free speech uh, is important, but you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't offend religious uh, minorities. Um, and then uh, I, I think... You know, it, you just saw how things change. You know, Putin's Russia getting increasingly um, authoritarian, Erdogan in uh, in uh, in Turkey, uh, and so so this idea that you had, you know, in the in the late nineties, uh, maybe the early thousands, that free speech and uh, democracy and human rights would basically become globally entrenched. Uh, I you know I saw that. Um, I saw that ideal, that utopia, sort of dissolve in the face of, of very different uh, realities, and also increasingly, for instance, in, in the issues of, of national security, liberal democracies compromising free speech more and more, including uh, my own country, uh, Denmark. Did, did it compromise at all after the cartoon crisis? Uh, not in not in in uh, when it comes to laws after the cartoon crisis, um, but. I would say that the current center-right government has uh, compromised. So we have um, recently had a law adopted which says that if you're a religious preacher uh, and you you explicitly condone certain illegal acts, you can go to prison for three years. Or if you're an imam and you say, um, you know, Islam says that you that uh, apostates should be stoned and and that's a good thing. Or even Islam says that you know you can have four wives and that's a good thing. Then potentially you could go to prison for up to three years. Are any, is anyone going to prison? No, the, the law has not that I know of been enforced yet. We also have sort of a uh, and then we had a ban against the 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 burqa and the cap, like the face covering uh, veil, which obviously also has 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 free expression, uh, freedom of religion um, consequences. Um, and then we have a list of hate preachers who are not allowed to enter the country if they've said something undemocratic. In fact, uh, m- almost all of them are Muslim extremists, except Terry Jones, uh, the, the Florida preacher who burned the Quran, who was also on. But potentially, like, if you were, like, a hardcore evangelist, uh, evangelical preacher who had very strong views on homosexuality, uh, that homosexuality should be banned, then potentially as an American, you could also be banned from entering Denmark. Well, this is interesting because it seems as though Denmark is passing laws uh, that would buttress sort of what the right wing would want to see censored and not the lot. When you think of Europe, you think of protection uh, uh, for marginalized communities to the extent that the Muslim community in Denmark is a minority. It seems to be going after them and some of their more fundamentalist uh, members or preachers more harshly than it would be, say, any any other minority. Yeah, community. Ex- and that's a change. But but and that's the interesting thing because during the cartoon crisis, it was mostly the center right uh, who was said, you know, free speech is uh, almost absolute. We can't compromise on 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 free speech. We have to stand up to to uh, you know Muslim attempts to to limit free speech. And uh, I was of course very much on board with that. But now things have just completely changed, and you I, you see more and more unhinged proposals from right-wing uh, Danish politicians, uh, you know, about, you know, explicitly banning, you know, public uh, Muslim prayers. Uh, there was a, uh, 
there's a there's a Ramadan dinner recently in the in the town hall square in uh, in Denmark, uh, and you know you have a lot of politicians who said you know that should be banned, even though you know you had lots of political <laughs> demonstrations there. And you know I I can understand that you know you can be provoked by seeing people praying in a public square in a very secular country like Denmark. You know it's not my favorite uh, activity at all, but you know that's really the litmus test of free speech. Provoke to do what, though? I mean, it, it, you, you you have so little self control that you start pulling your no, hair it's and just like, your teeth. Yeah, yeah, no, but it, it the same that you know you we have. If you go to a uh, a demonstration and you see you know Nazis or communists, whatever, you get provoked by the message. And but isn't that the whole point of free speech? That you know. Um, those those ideas that you, you hate those are you, you have to tolerate them um and that, that but but that is that is um that is becoming more difficult i would say uh in 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 denmark so this idea of cross fertilization of censorship yeah. what do you mean by that well you you mentioned the german law and i think that's a good example uh, it actually the idea i think originated uh, with the european union so the european union adopted this uh, code of conduct that twitter and facebook uh, and youtube signed that, uh, obliging them to remove hate speech within 24 hours um, but that's a that's a voluntary code of conduct it's, so it's i would i would call it you know an offer you can't refuse <laughs> in the terminology of the Godfather. So basically saying, hey, Facebook, Twitter, and Google, would you like to sign this voluntary code of conduct? If not, we're going to pass a law obliging you to do so. And they did so. And then the Germans went a step further and said, hey, we're going to make this into an actual law. And what happened then? Well, this idea was picked up by Putin's Russia. And it's also being discussed in a number of other countries like the Philippines, um, and we've seen the idea of, of fake news laws um, that that has been spreading rapidly. France is considering one. France is considering one. Malaysia has has adopted one. Kenya is on the brink, and the European Union has actually also said that it it might do this. Um, well, you, what's what's wrong with a fake news law? Well, uh, it it would be uh, interesting to to in this country, for instance, uh, to to see how it would be uh, applied, um, or who would decide exactly who would decide. I I, I don't think uh, in in this country you'd be able to get Republicans and Democrats to agree on which media were the peddlers of fake news and which ones were the dependable ones. I think Wait, you don't it, think Democrats <laughs> think CNN is fake news. I think you know if you had uh, if if Democrats got to to uh, to 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 draw up the list, uh, it would probably be you know Fox or Breitbart and so on, and and Republicans would uh, shut down CNN and MSNBC and so on. In fact, I think one of the most disturbing things I've seen in the U.S. was this poll di- done last year by the Economist, which showed that something like forty five percent of Republicans were in favor of allowing courts to shut down media that, you know. Get, uh, published distorted or biased uh, news. I mean, that to me was just completely mind-boggling. You know, I, it's difficult to think of a more blatant disregard for the for the, for the First Amendment. But and obviously, you know, in the in the U.S. history, first of all, in colonial times, a lot of the uh, you know a lot of uh, of the colonies had actually really strong laws against uh, false information. And then you had the Sedition Act in in 1798 which also went into that territory and sent you know critics of of John Adams uh in uh, in prison um if you take the you know the French revolution during the the terror you you had uh, false information was a was a was a crime punishable by death um so so people lost their heads uh when they wrote some when when they wrote something that whoever was in power at that month uh, didn't like um so so uh, and of course you know you can find it in all ages um you know the the bolsheviks when they when they when they won the revolution uh there was this discussion between lenin and others and Len, and and some of these idealistic bolsheviks said you know we're not going to introduce censorship now i mean we were we were censored before and lenin basically says are you kidding me 
Of course, we're going to have uh, censorship. We can't allow you know the the capitalists to to spread false information and uh, and uh, so so I think it's an incredibly dangerous concept to allow you know an authority to def- to determine what is uh, fake news. So Germany isn't doing that though. It is yeah. it is it has passed a law that requires the removal of hate speech within 24 hours, building on the European Commission's non-binding agreement with Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, YouTube, and other social media companies. And before, you have this interesting note in your essay, before the uh, the law was passed, Facebook would remove somewhere around 40% of content flagged or reported as hate speech. Now they're removing 100% of the content. That seems to be like a no-brainer to me if you're running Facebook and a fine for any one missed hate speech post is 50 million euros you cast a wide net yeah of course i mean uh, what's your you know what's your incentive if you're facebook you don't want to get on the wrong side of 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 german authorities and and what was interesting is that according to this new york times article that i quote the, facebook has a so called deletion center with 1200 employees in germany that you know go through a depressing mix of selfies and cat videos and and, and hate speech to determine what a job, right? Yeah, um, and and obviously there's an incentive there to err on the on the, you know on 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 the side of of being very restrictive because do you want to stand up for you know um, xenophobes or do you want to be on the good side of of the German government and and not you know uh, risk a, a huge fine. But but when it comes to you know there, there are other uh, examples of of this cross fertilization. Uh, one one example is under European law, there is also a there's also uh, a prohibition to to prohibit. Uh, uh, there's an obligation to prohibit certain qualified forms of Holocaust denial. Uh, and now then you had uh, Eastern Central and Eastern European states that said, wait, wait a minute, you know we lived for a long time under communists totalitarian systems. We also want the denial of communist crimes to be uh, a crime. The EU so far has rejected that, but a number of these states have basically taken uh, Holocaust denial criminal codes from from countries like uh, Germany, Austria, and then made their own just and just said, well, these are applicable to communist uh, to communist crimes. Um, so, so that's another example of, of cross fertilization of, of censorship. In the social media context, you compare what is happening to the congregation of the index, which was responsible for the index of prohibited books established by the Catholic Church in 1559. Why do you do that? Because I see some of the same uh, impulses behind it, like uh, that the the Catholic Church originally praised the printing press as a divine art because, you know, among other things, you could print indulgence certificates, which made the Catholic Church a lot of money. But then Martin Luther comes along, uh, and he becomes the most widely read uh, author in Europe. And he, you know, he he writes these incredibly effective pamphlets that that just hammer away at the authority of the church, and, and Europe fractures. Uh, and 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 so the Catholic Church becomes extremely concerned, uh, and they say, you know, we have to control what is being read. In in uh, in Catholic uh, in Catholic uh, states, um, so 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 it, it's a bit the same that not where you see now uh, government saying we have to be able to control what is being spread on the internet. Traditional gatekeepers, you know, uh, mainstream media that you know you know that could be relied on to you know to to toe a, a certain line uh, we can you know we can no longer control them you know people ordinary people can say whatever they want um, and and that's dangerous to the social cohesion um, and so so and and in certain ways especially you know facebook says they want to use artificial intelligence to 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 uh, to weed out hate speech and, and other sorts of of, of illegal uh, speech if they if they do that, if they roll that out globally, um, then obviously it'll be a much more efficient instrument than the index uh, on censorship. You know, the index was, uh, I mean, in certain ways it was efficient, but sometimes, you know, often they couldn't read like English or German. So lots of books would just uh, pass through and they also didn't always have have ways to always enforce it. Um, so so that's, that's why. Is your, is your issue with what 
Germany is doing, the fact that a government is compelling these social media companies to censor, or even if that didn't exist, there wasn't this German law and social media companies were policing speech in this way on their own, would that still be a problem? Because Jonathan Rausch, in, in his response to your essay, uh, the, the essay is entitled Free Speech as Norms Erode, he argues that we should think of social media companies like Facebook as publishers. And publishers have always sor sort of served as a gatekeeper, uh, trying to get the most compelling arguments on its publish publishing platforms, ensuring fake arguments or fake news isn't on their publishing platforms, and removing that which is fake. And he's, he sees Mark Zuckerberg through the use of AI and through the use of uh, human intelligence trying to figure out how Facebook could make that work yeah. as a new generation publisher. And he thinks the German government can't compel them to do that in a way that would be effective, but we should allow Mark Zuckerberg to have the chance on his own. Yeah, I think that it's definitely more problematic when you have a government do, uh, compelling someone to do it because it will inevitably, you know, all laws that restrict free speech reflect power in a certain sense. So at, at, a, at a basic level, the, the red lines drawn will be those that uh, those in power uh, don't like. Yeah, you know, it will be aimed at the speech that, that those in power uh, find most uh, troubling. Um, so that's obviously a, a problem when you compel um, social media companies to do it. Um, Facebook on its own, you know, you know, obviously they have uh, a right as a private company to set uh, certain uh, standards uh, and i you know should it, it not they shouldn't be compelled on the other hand to allow porn or you know uh, whatever i think the problem is that the 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 market share whatever you want to call it of facebook uh, is ha has become so so dominant so so may it maybe if if there were if there were like three or four Facebooks with different standards, um, it would not become uh, such a monopoly uh, on 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 how um, speech standards are, are are being used. But if if and I'm not saying that is the case, but um, if Facebook with with its dominance <clears throat> in in many jurisdiction jurisdictions police speech in a manner that is politically skewed, so saying you know people on the right uh, have less leeway in making controversial arguments than those on the left, or certain groups are more protected than others, then I would say de facto it has the potential of, 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 of being a, a, a problem. Not one that I think we can solve uh, legally, not one that fits neatly into uh, how we understand uh, free speech. But I guess you could you could approach it in the same way that fire approaches you know uh, free free speech on on private you know, colleges and, and universities you say yeah we we acknowledge that the first amendment does not apply here but as a university you have committed to you know ideals of academic freedom and you should uphold them yeah, even through though, your contracts yeah, through yeah. your student yeah and, and just handbooks. like the, uh, the also the, like the ideal of, of being an, an, uh, a place where different ideas can engage uh, each other Yeah, I don't want to get too bogged down on the social media stuff because we'll come back to that when we review some of the other essays. So you start your essay by laying out what you see as cause for concern internationally in the free speech case. Then you move next to talking about this cross-fertilization of censorship and how censorship in one country doesn't stay within those borders and has a way of influencing or encouraging other states to pursue censorship laws or hate speech codes or speech codes about another form. And then you sort of end your essay by talking about studies of free speech and its outcomes, because the burden is on us as free speech advocates to prove that free speech results in greater political freedom and more prosperity and more fulfilled lives. But how do we analyze that? It's really hard to isolate variables in a way to determine the positive or negative effects that an environment that sees open discourse might have on any given society. So you 
are, are trying to trying to do that with um, the political scientist Rasmus Fonaspeak Anderson. Did yeah, I pronounce yeah, that yeah, correctly? Yeah. How are you doing that? Well, uh, we uh, we look at uh, we use a, a number of, uh, of, of of huge data sets, and then we look at uh, obviously uh, correlations between uh, free speech, media freedom, internet freedom, and different different types of uh, of conflicts. And 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 I th- I don't think you, as you said, you can't. It's very difficult to isolate uh, to as to, sufficiently to say with any certainty that if you uh, abolish uh, this hate speech law, then the the level of conflict will be affected this way or the other. So, you know, basically what we say uh, is is that in general, especially in liberal uh, democracies, free speech is associated with less uh, violent uh, conflict um, and I think uh, Jeremy Waldron, so he, he gets it in his critique, gets a little bit wrong because he says that uh, our, that our argument is that if you allow untrammeled free sp- uh, hate speech, then conflicts will uh, will will diminish. That's actually not what we're saying. What we're saying is that in general, free, uh, countries with strong free speech protections tend to experience less violent conflict than than uh, those uh, with with less robust uh, free speech protection. We'll get to Jeremy Walder's yeah. arg- argument uh, here in a minute because I think he seems to think you're talking solely about hate speech. Yeah, laws. yeah, he he, he basically we, we we talk I mean we look at it much much broader. So it's a general uh, it's a it, it's a general uh, argument. Uh, it's not just uh, about uh, hate speech. But you know, I would I would certainly acknowledge that that um, that speech can uh, and has uh, led to uh, to violence for, for violence for instance uh, you, you know there are studies showing uh, that in in Rwanda for instance you get, you had radio stations that um, that incited violence uh, during the genocide uh, there and um, um, the dangerous speech project at Harvard is very very fascinating uh, uh, looking at types of speech that uh, that increase just before you have sort of violent uh, outbreaks of, of, of genocide uh, and the like but the interesting thing about the dangerous speech project is that it that it um, defines dang- dangerous speech much more narrowly than the hate speech standards that someone like Jeremy Waldron uh, would, would argue remember that Jeremy Waldron is someone who couldn't quite make up his mind whether the cartoons were hate speech or not which to me was astonishing because, you know, most people would say, well, if anything, that would fall under blasphemy laws. And most, you know, people would, would argue that in, in modern states, blasphemy laws are incompatible with, <laughs> with, with, with freedom of expression. But, but Jeremy Waldron seems to uh, only very grudgingly is, uh, acknowledge that, that cartoons, the cartoons were, were not uh, hate speech. So that, but the Dangerous Speech Project uh, says that you know dangerous speech includes at least an element of incitement to violence, or, or that it's speech that can be that is understood by by the recipients to call to be a call uh, to to violence. And I and I and I would not argue that that cannot lead to uh, to social conflicts. Um, well, here in the United States, that would be proscribed speech. I mean, calls to imminent lawless action I, uh, would be punishable. Yeah. Like what happened in Rwanda yeah. when they're saying on the radio station, "Here they are, go get them, go yeah. kill them now." That there's there's no way that would be protected speech in yeah, the United States. No, but I think the 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 dangerous speech project may that their definition of dangerous speech would, would perhaps not be as uh, you know as strict as the Brandenburg uh, test here in, in the U.S., but nonetheless have have an element of of uh, incitement. Uh, to violence, and then we 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 also point to other studies. So there's a Norwegian study which which basically looks at right wing extremist uh, violence in Western Europe and argues that one of the contributing factors to ex- right wing extremist extremist violence may be attempts to to basically shut out right wing extremist political parties from 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 the public discourse. Uh, yeah, I think the the author finds, as you put it in your essay that extensive public repression of radical right actors and opinions has been one of the likely drivers of right-wing extremist violence in Northern Europe and highlights the paradox that countermeasures intended to constrain radical right politics appear to fuel extreme 
outright violence. Exactly. So, so, so um, there's also been studies by Pew that that sh- that that show that countries that have uh, high degrees of religious violence uh, are also those that have you know less religious uh, um, free, or, or have the strictest laws against, for instance, blasphemy uh, and uh, and so on. Um, and we have studies that show that Muslim countries that enforce blasphemy laws experience uh, higher degrees of um, uh, Muslim terrorism than those that that do not. So, so all of these all of these studies point. Um, and I, but but and, and again, I'm not making defense. Is this a survey of the literature? Or are you doing original analysis? We're, we're, here? we're both we're, we're both doing a, a survey and also uh, using uh, data uh, on our own. But so so we're we're not making anything like the uh, broad sweeping uh, and very specific claims that that Jeremy Waldron sort of says that we are. Um, we're, we're, I think are, we're saying uh, that the argument that, um, that allowing for ex- extreme speech uh, should lead to more violence is at best lacking in nuance, and that's something very different than, than, than saying... You do acknowledge in your essay that censorship can have negative consequences. You say in the world's most closed societies, we yeah. do find that loosening censorship can exacerbate yep. existing conflicts. That, that's, that, that's exactly true. And I think there's also been studies showing that media freedom in, in, in countries with a high degree of uh, intolerance can actually exacerbate uh, can actually exacerbate a conflict. So again, it, it may be that it's liberal democracies where uh, where free speech has um, the most de-radicalizing uh, effect. So let's move on to Anthony Leaker's response to you. So he was the first essay response in the Cato Unbound series, and this can all be found on Cato's website. Uh, Anthony Leaker, for context, he's a principal lecturer in cultural and critical theory at the University of Brighton, the United Kingdom, and he has a background in literature and philosophy with a particular focus on Wittgenstein, I hope I pronounced that Wittgenstein, name. Wittgenstein, I think. Wittgenstein, and uh, contemporary North American fiction. And he's actually writing a book right now called Against Free Speech. And that's the title of his essay here as well. And I think that book comes out in the fall, and I'm going to try and get him on the podcast uh, yeah. once it's out. But his main argument in his response to you seems to ignore a lot of the arguments you're making and makes this blanket claim that just free speech argument generally is a Trojan horse. He says, in my view, the world is likely to and indeed has become less free, secure, and prosperous precisely because of the policies, ideologies, and values endorsed and promoted by the very people who insist on fostering the idea that there is a free speech crisis or who use free speech as a Trojan horse for advocating right-wing ideologies. What do you make of that argument that free speech is just a Trojan horse to push some retrograde ideologies for people like Milo Yiannopoulos and Richard Spencer to advance arguments that seem to be uh, attacking marginalized communities in the United States and elsewhere, and that when they are criticized or when they face consequences for, for that speech, they then fall back on the free speech argument and not necessarily on the defense of their underlying arguments that got them in trouble in the first place. I think there's certainly no lack of hypocrisy and double standards on on, on free speech. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's uh, exclusive to the right. I think it's it also exists very much uh, on the left. I think it ex- exists among most human groups uh, because we have strong confirmation bias as a species um, uh, but that to me does not uh, does not uh, take away from the general principle of free speech just because someone advances says you know um, advances free speech um, when they're you know when someone tries to shut them shut them down or no platform them from a university or use it when they're criticized does not make invalid the principle uh, of free speech uh, as such. Plus, free speech 
if you if if we take it seriously, must obviously also um, protect people who are disingenuous uh, and have ideas that Anthony Leaker uh, disagrees with. I mean, when 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 I boil down his his essay, it it basically I cannot come to any other conclusion that. Anthony, Anthony Leaker doesn't like free speech because a lot of people whose ideas he hates exercise, exercise their right to free speech and invoke free speech when you know they're deplatformed or they're taking measures uh, against them, and then some of them do this do so hypocritically. Um, uh, and uh, I will freely admit that you know it's a built-in feature of free speech that people that you dislike have the right to say things that you hate. Um, if you don't, if, if you don't like that concept, then yes, you're, you're against free speech. Uh, but would you grant him that certain people are using free speech as a Trojan horse to advance ideologies that he, or you perceive to be, to be retrograde? Sure. I mean, uh, that the right, for example, has taken up the cause of free speech sure. lately precisely because in some jurisdictions or some states, their ideologies are no longer respected by a majority or a vocal minority, whatever it might sure. be. Sure, and then you have to the, – the, the test is always then, are these people then also defending their ideological enemies? Um, and if they're not – you don't say, well, then free speech is no longer a valid principle. You call them out saying you don't really care about free speech. Uh, I mean, that, that, that someone, you know, advocates free speech on, <laughs> on, a, hypocrit on a hypocritical basis does not... Uh, well, it could be that they're not being hypocritical. I mean, some of these people might defend free speech for all. Uh, yeah. But they're using free speech as cover for the but advancement then, of other, other but ideas. But then it's not. Then it's not a cover. Then you're just exercising your free speech to advance ideas that you and I uh, may find retrograde. But but you know, uh, the, you know, there's always going to. So be then we need to call them out and say, sure, that what what you're doing here is not becoming a free speech advocate. You're just ignoring the conversation that you were having originally or that we want to have with you under the by taking cover under the free speech principle yeah i mean if you if, if i mean if you're suggesting that you know if i criticize milo or or someone and he says oh you're against my free speech which they sometimes yeah, do yeah i mean yeah then then that's just you know that's then, not hypocritical that's, no, just, that's not just understanding the principle yeah that's just i mean then you flunk you know first year of of uh a free speech 101 um, because free speech one of the important reasons of free speech is exactly that you know we should have robust debates and we can debate the underlying issues uh, uh, I, I mean but in some cases the precisely the people Anthony Leaker would support are more or less building the Trojan horse for the right insofar as they're enabling this free speech argument precisely yeah, because exactly. they're pursuing censorship of the people that they should otherwise just be criticizing. Exactly. I mean, if 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 Anthony Leaker and, and all those who most vehemently despise Milo and and his ilk, if if they were not attempting to 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 no platform him and and you know in Europe use hate speech laws and so on, then there wouldn't be you know there would be no hill to die on for 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 the Milos of this world because they would just be be out there. They could advance their ideas. You could engage them or you could ignore them, whatever you know, you wanted. But you wouldn't give them the the martyrdom of of, uh, of free speech. And, and and let's not forget that martyrdom is really. And if really, really efficient platform for 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 rallying, uh, rallying the troops and those who uh, who who agree with you. I mean, you know, Western civilization. You have Jesus, and you have Socrates. I mean, what that that's you know, both of them died because of things that they said and ideas that they spread, and you know, their ideas still live on. You can <laughs> well, well, Jesus certainly. Uh, he was a threat to the political order through the advocacy of his ideas. I, people see him, the scholarship, not so much as a uh, as being put to death for his his religious beliefs, but more or less his, his political. Yeah, beliefs. I mean, so you have this debate, like you know, you know, the Gospels try to paint a picture of him being, uh, 
being uh, being executed for blasphemy, whereas whereas biblical scholars tend to say no, it was actually uh, he was seditious against the the the, uh, the the Romans. Yeah, and the and the main source of evidence for that is that the Romans didn't crucify blasphemers; they cru- yeah, crucified exactly. political yeah. dissidents. And also, his statements um, did not technically. Um, constitute blasphemy under Jewish law, at least according to some scholars. I, I actually want to do uh, an expert opinion on on the trial of Jesus, um, but 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 have um, I, that that's one of the things I want to do on the podcast because it's it's quite uh, interesting. Mm-hmm. And of course, and of course, Socrates. Um, yeah, there's there's <laughs> there's disagreement there as to whether he really was a martyr for yeah. Free speech, or whether he was he was put to death or forced to drink the hemlock for other exactly. reasons. Exactly. I mean, was he the most virtuous man in history, according to to John Stuart Mill, or was he really sort of an uh, anti democratic demagogue who had enabled treasonous uh, Athenians to to re- to overthrow uh, whatever whatever uh, whatever? I mean, both of them clearly became became among their supporters martyrs and the the fact that they are catalysts for, for causes yeah, yeah. for huge movements yeah. and and you know and you see that again uh, and again so so when you i mean if you really one of the things i've taken away from doing this history of free speech is that you, repression and censorship can work but then you really have to go all in i mean uh, if you just do if you do it as a democracy where you find people or remove their content or maybe just put them a few days in jail you're more likely to create uh, martyrs and create a platform if you really want to do if you really want their ideas to disappear you know you have to be like the medieval inquisition where you you know or the soviet union and send some assassins to mexico to kill uh yeah <laughs> to put an axe in the head of the the greatest dissident the country had so, so um so yeah trotsky for those aren't yeah. not familiar with the story so trojan horse he then goes to say the free speech defense inverts actual power relations for example the people making racist statements assert their victimhood when called out for their racism decry censorship while at the same time anthony laker argues denying their critics a voice and they also refuse to consider how the conditions or terms of communication are not only biased but structured in their favor. How would you respond to the argument that some of these people who he alleges are using the Troj- the free speech Trojan horse to give cover to their other retrograde ideologies are denying their critics a voice? Are you seeing that so much? I don't know how you are denying someone a voice. I mean, if even if you're, let's let's take Charlottesville. Um, if you're, you know, a KKK neo-Nazi, you know, have you know really hardcore racist uh, views and you probably protest in Charlottesville, then you exercise your First Amendment rights. But I don't see that. How, do you, how does that silence uh, minorities? Well, I think this is what, because I've read a lot of these sorts of arguments before. I think this is what Anthony Leaker would say. He would say that an environment which is riddled with racist, sexist, xenophobic statements creates an environment whereby people in those communities, uh, in those minority communities, feel afraid to speak out. Mm. I, I, yeah, and and may, maybe, maybe and that's how may, the voices maybe are maybe research has been done on that. But I, I would say you know there's certainly no lack of. Uh, racial justice, social justice initiatives in in this country. You have Black Lives Matter. You know, every time I go into my office in the Riverside Church, uh, um, uh, um, I that there's a banner for Black Lives Matter when I take the elevator uh, up, um, and and you have lots of conversations uh, about uh, about that. And I would say, you know, compared. To, and again, I'm not I'm not an American. I'm not an expert on this. But if you go back to the '60s and the civil rights movement, you know you had people being arrested in the South for kneeling and praying outside town halls in Georgia. You had people being arrested for holding up a sign with "One Man, One Vote," and these sort of civil rights um, activists uh, had to. You know their their First Amendment rights were denied by biased local judges and had to be upheld. 
you know, by federal by federal courts. Um, so uh, first of all, that shows to me that the First Amendment has been the ally of uh, of racial justice, uh, and also that the conditions for opposing racism and xenophobia are much better today than they were, uh, you know, in the 60s, for instance. Yeah, two points on that score. You have this great line in your response to Leaker where you talk about the former slave and civil rights activist Ida B. Wells, how she combined bravery with journalism to document the sickening extent of lynchings in the South. And whites retaliated by burning down her newspaper, which was called free speech, forcing her to flee to the north amid an avalanche of death threats. And, you know, presumably in an environment with robust protections of free speech, you would uh, protect people like Ida B. Wells. And, you know, at a certain point, the First Amendment really did come to the defense of, of civil rights activists, even if the promissory note wasn't fulfilled. And, and you talk about Frederick Douglass as well, exactly. who was a big advocate of free speech after his abolitionist meetings in Boston were shut down by mobs. But I would grant Anthony Laker this point. I would say that robust discussion that is immensely critical or attacking you as a person in any different way, whether it's your identity or the beliefs you hold, can force people into silence. I, I think living in a democracy requires a sense of fortitude, you know, some resilience to be able to take the slings and arrows of the the democratic de debate that comes from sure. having a multitude of opinions. And, you know, if you want a government that protects you from offense, that protects you from hurtful or offensive words, uh, you're going to need to restrict democracy in some meaningful ways. And, and I don't know that that's a price I'm, I'm willing to pay. Maybe, maybe it's not because I'm in a, in a minority group, Maybe minority groups think that, that those lines can be drawn in a way that doesn't hurt democracy. But my opinion, my bias is, well, you know, then you get constriction of immigration debates. You get constriction of affirmative action debates. You get the religious right winning in the South during the civil rights era. I, I, I don't like the idea of how those lines will be drawn and who will be enforcing them. Yeah, you know, and it's true, you know, conformity and, you know, and, and fear of, of, of being... Uh, attack rhetorically can certainly uh, mean you know that you apply self censorship, but that is not limited to to racist or, or I mean that can be that, that can be anything that, it can be anything that yeah. can be when I get, say something stupid on Facebook and ganged up, get ganged up by ten of my yeah. ten of my uh, closest friends are telling me I'm an idiot. I yeah. mean that. So for some people, that animates them, and they they dive into debate. For other people, they sort of cower, maybe delete their post, and um, I mean, if it's a An choice you make. If Anthony Leaker's argument against free speech becomes very popular, and lots of people started, you know, ganging up on people who made pro free speech arguments, then presumably, perhaps some of those who made pre pro free speech arguments could, you know, feel afraid to to. Uh, to, to advance them uh, in the public, does that mean that we should limit Anthony Leaker's ability to, to <laughs> uh, criticize uh, free speech? No, I don't yeah. think so. He says in his essay, if there is a free speech crisis at all, then it is the free speech has been co-opted to serve anti-democratic ends, has become the rallying point of decidedly unemancipatory political formations, has been evoked to attack equal rights, social justice, and basic norms of tolerance and inclusion. In this guise, it is far removed from the million, that's the John Stuart Mill, ideal of serving the pursuit of truth, progress, and the improvement of mankind. What do you make of that argument? Well, again, it's this idea that free speech should serve basic uh, ideological ends that Anthony Leaker uh, agrees with. And, and you know, my, my you know, I, I'm not familiar with, with Leaker's work apart from, 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 from his essay, but it, would, it seems to me that he would find it very difficult to agree with 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 most uh, sort of mainstream political uh, ideas uh, today, and that you know uh, he 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 would find um, a lot of what we would say more mainstream political ideas to be retrograde and repressive, uh, maybe maybe uh, even racist. So so if free speech were to serve the ends that Anthony Leaker uh, 
would would <laughs> seems to be see, seems to say is the precondition for real true free speech then that would uh, that that would disqualify a whole lot of people um but with he seems to think his side will win well yeah uh, that, that's i guess that's uh, that's not uh, impossible um but i think that the you know uh, the, the reality would 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 be that if we were to if we were to to give up on free speech let's say let's say to let's say tomorrow anthony rica wins the case the first amendment is repealed we remove free free speech protections from 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 human rights conventions and and constitutions in europe um then i think very quickly we would see that the, the you know it would not be a, a world where free speech protections were molded along the lines that Anthony Leake would want uh, everywhere and and that political majorities would very soon find ways to to restrict free speech in ways that that Anthony Leake would be against the essay that you wrote responding to Leaker sort of envisions a world where Anthony Leaker wins out yeah and talks about some of the laws or legal environments that might develop in the United States and elsewhere, uh, you know, talking about in the UK, Prime Minister Jerry, Jeremy Corbyn has strengthened laws against religious hatred by reviving a previously defeated bill, making it a crime to insult the religious feelings of believers. Uh, you talk about how in the United States and the South, there are bans on the construction of mosques and Muslims from holding public office or the advocacy of Sharia law. And you just go, you know, jurisdiction by jurisdiction saying, okay, we remove these protections, we remove the protections for free speech. Here is what might happen. And I can't go through all of it because like two pages of what might happen. But I'd urge our readers to go check it out. One of the things I think Leaker is concerned about, and we've already touched up on this a little bit, is the idea that the that free speech has opened a path for the civil rights movement, for the women's suffrage movement, for the gay rights movement. And now we have sort of reached the end of history. We have, we have accomplished most of what we want to accomplish, so we can close the door behind us. And what we see the First Amendment and free speech protections doing now are, because they've won so strongly and the court precedent for them is so good, being moved in other directions, protecting corporations or or protecting sort of economic rights. And I went to a March symposium at Columbia University, uh, where you are a visiting fellow. The symposium was called a First Amendment for All, question mark, yeah. free expression in an age of inequality. And I was really struck by all the panelists there. It was admittedly a progressive conference, but they all looked skeptically at the First Amendment, not necessarily as sort of in the scholarly skeptical way that one might look at the First Amendment if they're called upon to figure out where its holes might be, but rather they, I, I think, deeply felt that the First Amendment was no longer moving in a direction that is a force for good. And that's, I think, where people like Anthony Leaker come from. I think if we lived in a First Amendment environment that was the 1970s, for example, the civil rights um movement has has just won or is winning uh, women's suffrage has has passed albeit decades before gay rights is is starting to become a movement then anthony linker would say it was good but now you, he looks at things like citizens united he looks at how it's increasingly moved into the economic sphere and it's now becoming a threat to the progressive cause this whole conference i went to was how do we roll back the expansion of 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 the First Amendment, they were calling it their First Amendment Lochnerism, which, yeah, if you're familiar yeah. with the Lochner case, uh, really expanded the rights of employers uh, in the country before it was subsequently revoked. Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, many of the examples that I use to to have this future scenario where the First Amendment has been repealed, <clears throat> I, I I actually tie it into actual proposals. Um, or developments. So the idea of, of banning the construction of mosques is something that has some have tried to achieve through zoning laws because the First Amendment won't allow it. Ben Carson said, you know, a Muslim shouldn't become president. You had, I think, 14 states that had 
enacted or tried to enact laws against uh, Sharia law uh, uh, in, in the South. So these were not just like figments of the imagination. And, and I mentioned the poll of Republic, 45% of Republicans being willing to, that court should be allowed to shut down uh, media. So take away the protection and, and, and what we're not, we're, what Leaker and, and those concerned about the current direction of the First Amendment, I don't think would, would be a progressive agenda. I mean, do you think that a country that led by President Trump and a, and a, and a, and a, and a Republican majority in Congress would adopt a progressive agenda on free speech uh, if, if they were given free reigns, if the First Amendment was not there? Um, I don't think so. Uh, it might be that in a number of... So well, I, that's, that's, the, that's the argument. I mean, the, well, that's actually the presumption that you, you hold enough political power that you will get to ensure that, that the speech you like isn't censored. But, you know, at the same time, you're also claiming that the people you're trying to protect ha hold no political power and are oppressed yeah. and that these laws won't backfire on them. I mean, there's, there's this presumption that the people who will be enforcing these laws will be angels. They almost certainly won't be. But even if you did have an angel, uh, let's say a mortal one, uh, there will have to be a subsequent person that enforces the laws. And even if you trust Donald uh, Trump, the next president might be Hillary Clinton. Or even if you trust Barack Obama, the next president might be Trump. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and I would say, you know, unless, you know, the faculty of critical theory at, at, at you know, some liberal arts college is given absolute power, then 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 I don't think uh, I think Lika would be would be horrified to see where we would move uh, in in a world based on the principle of, of being uh, against uh, free speech. Um, and, and you know we see it I mentioned in Denmark that that now the center right has has sort of limited uh, free speech. I think that, has been, or at least should be, a wake-up call for the Muslim minority in Denmark because they were the ones who were calling for limits on free speech during the cartoon crisis. They didn't get, they didn't uh, achieve success because they were a minority, and they have been unable to stop restrictions on free speech because they're a minority, even though those restrictions are basically aimed uh, at them. So, so I think you play a very dangerous game when you, when when you say we we want restrictions on free speech that conform with our ideological outlook um even even if even even if you you don't really believe in free speech as a principle then you should adopt it as as, as a as, tactic as, yeah you know out of self-interest well yeah that democracy protects political majorities these sort of enumerated rights that we have in the bill of rights here in the united states protect political minorities down to a minority of one so unless you think you can take care of the democracy part you better you know, respect the First Amendment because you're in a, you're in a, you're in a political minority. So he he ends his essay by saying by quoting Samuel Johnson, who said, "How is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from slave drivers? Then, as and now, the loudest defenders of free speech were those least likely to grant it to others." Now, I take particular issue with this because the loudest defenders of free speech are people that work in my circles at Fire. Um, you know, at the Institute for Justice, uh, you know, people like yourself, I don't see anyone in those communities who does serious free speech work on a day-to-day -day basis calling for censorship of others. No, I, I really no, don't see no. that. So it's this is a nice rhetorical flourish, Anthony Laker, but the free speech defenders I know, the ones who are doing it sincerely and lo most loudly, are not trying to deny no, it. And, and even like if you take an organization like Penn with Suzanne Nossel, which is very progressive, they 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 certainly don't call for 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 censorship, and they they advocate uh, free speech um, and and acknowledge uh, its 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 worth. So so there are certainly also good people on the left and in progressive liberal circles who acknowledge uh, uh, free speech. Uh, as you know, go to ACLU to talk to someone like David Cole. Um, he, he'll he'll make a very compelling case. Yeah, to accept his argument, you would need to accept that the loudest defend loudest defenders of free speech out there are people like Milo Yiannopoulos and Richard yeah. Spencer. And I would say that's not the case. But then yeah. you would have the burden in proving that point and also proving that they are seeking to deny free speech rights to others. Uh, 
and I don't know enough about either of them and all their public comments to to say whether that's the case or not. I think Richard Spencer in a radio interview admitted to using free speech as a political tactic sort of to gain mm, political yeah. power oh, and then to censor others. So it might be the case with him, with Milo Yiannopoulos. I'm not too familiar. But, 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 and, but this, and this is not limited. Again, this tactic of using free speech um, is, is not limited to, to the right uh, or, or the left. It's something that's been used uh, throughout uh, history. Um, as your podcast demonstrates. Yeah. <laughs> So let's move on now to Jeremy Waldron's critique of your essay. Uh, Jeremy Waldron, for those unfamiliar with him, teaches legal and political philosophy at New York University School of Law. Until recently, he was also a professor of social and political theory at All Souls College, Oxford University. And as previously mentioned in 2012, he wrote the book, The Harm in Hate Speech. So the focus of Jeremy Waldron's essay is pretty much to ask questions of you about the the research, the survey research and data research that you're conducting about the efficacy yeah. of free speech in creating positive outcomes. Uh, he, his his uh, essay is entitled "Some Questions for Yaka Mushingama." Yeah. So the first question, let's ro- let's roll through them and let's try and do it pretty quickly because we're over an hour here <clears throat> already, and I still want to get to Jonathan Rausch's essay. He asked, "What democracies were studied?" Yeah, uh, so so we included most uh, countries uh, in the world. Uh, I think excluding those with uh, less than one million uh, people. So it's a it's a pretty broad uh, category of of countries. Now he says, he writes, among advanced liberal democracies, only the United States does not enjoy the benefit, such as it is, of legal restrictions on hate speech. Was it just a case of comparing the United States with the rest, with Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Israel, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and so on? So, what, where, where, how were the comparisons? No, no, happening? no. Like, like I said, it's 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 uh, it's, uh, it, it's not just comparing. Uh, we, I don't think we actually compared just uh, the U.S. Uh, I should say that being a lawyer, uh, it's it's Rasmus Andersen who has done the the the, the coding. Um, it's not something that the, the, that I have done, but 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 no, that's that's not the case. And also, I think Jeremy Waldron makes the mistake of assuming that this all is about free about hate speech. Which, yeah, we mentioned uh, that yeah, earlier. Where, uh, which it, which is which is not. It, it's much broader uh, data sets the, than than that. Yeah, I suspect that you can derive insights into a democracy or authoritarian countries respect or lack thereof of free speech without comparing it to so, like a control group like the United States, for yeah, example, which yeah, is what course. Jeremy Waldron seems to yeah, be because, suggesting. Because yeah. like there, there are groups that do surveys of economic freedom and there isn't any sort of benchmark country in which all those countries are compared to. They're sort of all compared against each other. Of course. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so um, yeah. So... Moving on to sort of his next question, and and before we get there, when do you plan to publish this yeah, research? It's, a, it's actually published in Danish, so it, so it's done in. Uh, we don't yet have uh, an English language uh, version, but what I'll do in my what I'll do just in like my, your uh, thousand page history on, of free yeah, speech in Denmark, right? Exactly. Uh, what I'll do uh, though is uh, in my reply to 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 Baldwin is that I'll I'll obviously translate uh, some of some of the things from the from the Danish. Uh, versions, you, some of the graphs, uh, and so on, to in- include it. Waldron also says, the question also needs to be answered because the essay presents the study as sometimes being about political freedom in general and sometimes about free speech in particular. Many of the countries I have mentioned will say that they are at least as free politically as the United States. Some would say emphatically that they are much more so. So what is it that is supposed to prevent social conflict? Political freedom in general or the absence of hate speech laws in particular. Now, we already talked about the, the, the problem with him focusing on hate speech, because that's not something you did, but... Uh, so, no, so, so it's, the, um, it's the robust... Protect, I would say generally it's the robust protection of free speech that is, that is associated with less uh, violent uh, conflict. So it's not uh, isolated to, to hate speech laws, which again is, is where I think... 
he 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 makes a mistake. Or, um, yeah, and, he's which, got a couple which, of other questions on hate speech which, too, which which is partially partially my my fault because I I just wrote about the study in in, in very few sentences. So so he can be forgiven for for making making assumptions that 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 are not relevant uh, to the study. He he has an interesting line in his response that confuses me, and I I hope you can sort of help me parse out what he means. He said. The British legislation, and I think he's referring to uh, like a hate speech law or yeah. of some sort. The British legislation prohibits the stirring up of hate against adherents of a given religion, but it doesn't prohibit criticism of the religion itself. Should this be coded for the purposes of your study as an instance of legislation protecting freedom of speech or as legislation limiting freedom of speech? My initial instinct is in either instance, it would be a piece of legislation limiting freedom of speech, whether it's just going after people who are stirring up hate, however that's defined against adherents of religion, or criticizing yeah. them. Yeah, but, but, but basically, the, the, so the, uh, the data sets that we use on freedom of uh, expression and, and, and media freedom um, are based on a number of different categories um, so, so, so to get an, an, an aggregate score on, on, on where you are in, in terms of, of freedom of expression and, and freedom of media. So it's not isolated uh, to, to hate speech laws, which, which makes the, the, the argument with Walburn somewhat difficult because that's what he overwhelmingly focuses on. Let's move to Jonathan Rausch now as we close out this conversation. His response was free speech as norms erode. Jonathan Rausch, for those of our listeners who didn't listen to our first ever podcast over two years ago, I think at this point, that podcast was with Jonathan Rausch. It's one I'm actually particularly proud of. He's a longtime uh, supporter of FIRES and, and free speech advocate. He's a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. He's the author of six books and many articles on public policy. And most famously, he's the author, at least in our circles, most famously, of the 1993 book, Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought, which was published by the University of Chicago Press, and a book I recommend to all of our listeners. Uh, I think if I would recommend any one book on free speech, it would probably be John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, but then the second would be, the close second would be Jonathan Rausch's book. But his main point, he's got two main points. The first one we've already sort of touched on is whether social media companies should be considered publishers and as such should have some latitude to determine what gets published on their platforms. His argument is that uh, Facebook can't edit everything, but thinking of it as a publisher makes the flaws of the German approach clearer. Editorial standards set in law and enforced by bureaucrats are both overbroad and ineffective. Responsible publishing judgment backed by laws against libel, threats, and other traditionally actionable abuses works better. Journalists have been successfully exercising it for generations. And then he talks about Mark Zuckerberg's model for policing social media. He says Zuckerberg's answer is a new kind of editing. First, artificial intelligence will boil the ocean, as they say in Silicon Valley, sifting through huge quantities of data to identify and rectify most problems. Then thousands of humans will make calls and hard cases. He goes on to say or ask how well Zuckerberg's hybrid model will work. It's impossible to know in advance, but it deserves a chance. I imagine you are a historian of free speech that when the printing press first came out and knowledge started to be disseminated on a mass way. Now you still had the problem of most people not knowing how to read, <laughs> so it couldn't be disseminated in the same way social media posts might have. But in any case, there probably weren't a lot of institutions or codes of ethics within those institutions to determine how to sift through true and false information or any other sort of information, information that might be deemed hateful or blasphemous, for example. And is it the case that it's just too soon to say whether social media has failed, given that it's an institution that's really only existed for a little over 10 years, to say that the printing press and news outlets, which came much later, were a failure because they weren't figuring out ways to eradicate yellow journalism through private codes of ethics, I think would have cut short the progress that those institutions made over the coming decades by uh, um, instituting sort of like checks and balances, editorial standards and whatnot. I think, you know, whenever you have a new revolutionary communication technology, what will happen is that you need 
a new um, culture of, of free speech and public debate to evolve. And, and like you said, we're, this is like the infancy uh, of, uh, of, of, of the age of social media. Uh, so in terms of social media literacy, uh, most of us uh, have not come very far. Uh, I suspect, or at least I hope, that you know we will. Most people will not be as gullible, perhaps, to towards fake news and digital echo chambers as the first generation uh, social media users were, because we've sort of figured out that uh, okay, not just because something confirms your ideological outlook. Uh, on in a Facebook post does not necessarily mean that it's uh, that, that that it's true. And yes, there are actually malicious actors out there who want to affect our political processes uh, and uh, and so on. So, so, but I don't know that that's what Rausch is so much arguing that we need to, after any new technological innovation, we need to learn to uphold a culture of free speech. I think he, what he's saying is these social media companies don't need free speech. They're publishers, just like the Washington Post and the New York Times is, albeit in a different way. And we would never expect like a truly robust culture of free speech in the pages of the New York Times. But it took the New York Times a while to become the New York Times, yeah. to set editorial standards, to set journalistic ethics. And we should therefore give social media companies like Facebook the time to set up more or less their own censorship regime for what material gets published their own editorial well, standards. yeah I, I i certainly wouldn't argue that you know facebook or and twitter can't have their community standards of, of what is acceptable speech the problem is one like i mentioned with facebook <clears throat> i mean it, it's difficult to make to to argue that facebook is a publisher in the same extent as new york times because we use each of us use Facebook to to publish our own ideas. That's not the that's not the case with the New York Times. New York Times has hired journalists and has editors, um, and and you know you and I can't just uh, publish. If 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 I write uh, an op-ed tomorrow or or write you know, that then the chances of, of that getting into the New York Times are, are pretty slim. Um, whereas uh, and and so everything that is put out by the New York Times is is reviewed by uh, an editorial process, and that. But the, see, I think what Jonathan would argue is that you're trying to fit social media into the same publishing framework as the Washington Post and New York Times, and I sort of made, the, I sort of tried to do that too in drawing comparisons. But Jonathan would argue. That is different. Yeah, that, it is, but it it's is. still a publisher, and and it's it is. Still- and I I don't have the 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 per, the, the the perfect uh, answer for it. Um, I think, like I said, the, a huge problem is when governments try to compel social media com- companies to toe a particular uh, to particular line. It is it is not in it uh, as such a problem to have community standards, but how they should you know how they should be drafted, what they should include and exclude, and how they should be enforced is a very, very difficult question. I, I, I'd like to see a world where you had more social media companies and not just... Uh, Facebook yeah, and Twitter. N- yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and ones that or might, Instagram, which yeah. is owned by Facebook, or YouTube, but, but which is owned that, by Google. Ones that might have different, um, that might have different uh, community standards so, so, so there'd be more well, plurality. You, well, I remember. I kind of grew up with MySpace. I remember how robo- if you were on social media, you were on MySpace back in 2004, for example. And I think one of the downfalls of MySpace was the sort of freewheeling nature of it, down to the fact that you could alter the HTML on the page if you had any even basic coding knowledge. And this created weird pages in a weird environment that, you know, I think parents might argue wasn't safe for their kids and you never knew what you were going to get on any given page. So if I'm a business owner of a social media company and I see the lesson of MySpace, I uh, might look at what Facebook's doing and trying to curate content as a, you know, a business necessity. Yeah. But, you know, you've already acknowledged that you know they have the right to do that, but I think you and Jonathan would agree that the government mandating it is the problem. Yeah, that's 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 the huge problem I I point to uh, here, and uh, 
um, and that might, like I argue in the article, you know, that might also have repercussions for Americans uh, if you say Facebook chooses to base its AI on the German model uh, because the idea of Facebook is to be a global community and not to, you know, be balkanized into having uh, different uh, different uh, standards. So that's that. There's an important conversation debate to to be to be had on that. Um, and and I I simply do not have the the perfect solution of of how we even in the absence of even if you know Germany were to to drop its its law tomorrow, I don't know how you know what would be the perfect solution for for how P Facebook should should regulate content on this platform. I have to admit, F fortunately, I don't have to think about it yet because <laughs> I, I, I'm only about to, uh, you know we're, we're still working on our, our second second part of the reformation. So I want to close up by touching on something Jonathan Rausch wrote about in the end of his essay that sort of surprised me. He wrote that he wasn't all that alarmed by European speech codes because they were embedded in free societies. But now those free societies are being overtaken by demagogues. In the past, if I haven't been as alarmed by European speech codes as Mushangama is, it's because these theoretically oppressive statutes, again, are embedded in fundamentally free societies whose publics will tolerate a certain amount of bureaucratic foolishness, but not wholesale censorship. In the hands of Theresa May or Emmanuel Macron and their supporters, hate speech laws worry me a little. But in the hands of Trump or Viktor Orban or Yaroslaw, I, I don't know how to pronounce that Polish last name, or Marine Le Pen and their supporters, these hate speech laws worry me a whole lot more. And it surprises me that Jonathan Rausch makes this argument because it seems a very clear free speech argument to me that you would never want to pass one of these laws because you never know who will hold power next. Yeah. But he seems to say, I, you know, I, they never bothered me because yeah. I it's, guess. it's, you know, I, I, I have tremendous respect for, for, for Jonathan. He, he's, he's one of my favorite thinkers on free speech, but it comes too close to Anthony Leaker territory <laughs> for, for, for me too, because it, it, it would, yeah, basically, be what Anthony Lika said that if if these speech uh, restrictions were in line with his uh, in with his outlook, um, so so. Um, but it's true that you know, liberal democracies in Europe have been able to to be free, have uh, free speech with hate speech laws. They're they're not totalitarian uh, states, uh, um, but I think um, but I think. <laughs> Exactly, because, like you said, you never know who's gonna uh, be there uh, next. Then you you can't just say it's okay uh, when Emmanuel Macron uh, or Theresa May uh, is in power. All right, well, Jakob, let's end it there. We're at ninety minutes. Uh, your podcast, Clear and Present Danger: A History of Free Speech, freespeechhistory.com, and this Cato Unbound essay series, uh, Free Speech in International Perspective can be found on Cato's website, right? Is there anything else I'm missing to plug? I think that was it. This podcast is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. I should mention that Clear and Present Danger also has Twitter and Facebook pages if you want to go over there or like and follow those. Uh, as in regards to this podcast, you can email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes, as I mentioned every week. And after you subscribe to Jakob's podcast, Clear and Present Danger, and if you enjoy it, please also leave a review on iTunes for that podcast as well. And until next time, I hope everyone is enjoying their summer and thank you again for listening. 